Up next is uh, Emma Zorov. Uh, he is a he's an algorithm maestro. He's uh, been working in reinforcement learning and control for many years. Uh, professor at the University of Washington. Um, uh, recently, his work on Mojoko has really uh, made a huge contribution to modern uh, deep learning and uh, reinforcement learning. And I very much look forward to some cool demos, which I'm sure we'll see. I just wanted to teach you guys and decided to be a businessman. And it's a good life. No teaching, no grant writing, no meetings. I cannot explain to you how good the life is. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about uh, model-based control specifically for, <laughs> for uh, physical systems. And uh, let me start with some uh, general comments. So when you do machine learning, you have the world. It generates data for you. And then you learn from the data. And the data is the only thing you know. You don't really know much beyond it. When we do control, something else happens. We have, of course, data. We do system ID, we build a model. And then when we do control synthesis or optimization or whatever, we use the model most of the time. Even those of us who run around claiming to be model free, you look at what they actually do. They have a model and promise you that one day when you know the moon is right, we're going to switch to real world. But that never happens. Um, now, interesting thing what happens when you have a model is you can treat it as if it's the world, send actions, generate data from it. But here, the data is essential, because that's all you know. Here, the data is just made up. What do I mean that by that? Well, the data is implicitly contained in your model. In fact, the model contains all the data in the world. Why are you sampling from something when you already know the answer? Um, and it's OK, because you, know, you can practice uh, for a distant future when RL actually becomes model free, as in you don't actually have a model. And one day, switch those. But you're missing out, because if you get rid of the middleman here and collect, connect your optimization box directly to the model, you can get a lot of stuff out of the model that's not in the form of data. If you're coming from machine learning, you might ask, how can something not be data? Well, there are lots of things that are not really in the form of data, like equations are not really data. You can ask the model to give you the math that's in it, for example. can't sample it. Uh, in practice, what we do in robotics, there are lots of things you can compute. For example, end effector Jacobians, these are very useful things that give you the mapping from joint velocities to end effector velocities and tell you how to go to targets without doing any learning, which is in microseconds. A lot of robots are controlled that way. You can get derivatives of dynamics. You can do inverse dynamics, which I'll talk about. You can look at what is the subspace that are actuated. You can get those analytically, not have to learn them. Distance fields, if you have geometries, those are very useful for planning and putting potential fields and collision avoidance and such. Stability criteria like center of pressure or force closure for locomotion. Lots of things that can just be computed, and it would be silly not to do so. Uh, now, you could say, OK, well, if you, if you build a control with respect to a model when you run it on the real world, is it going to work? That's a pretty legitimate question. Um, well, it, do, it does very <laughs> quite often. So let me just go briefly through a few uh, videos to remind you that it does. There are no proofs here. Why are there no proofs here? I mean, there are heroic people who do robust control and uh, try to provide certificates, whatever. All these people come up with assumptions that are not valid in the real world, and therefore, those certificates are not for real. I mean, it's nice to have some theory, but the reality is that when you're controlling a real physical system, there is not a single assumption that you can actually verify, so, oh, yeah, that thing is really true. So it isn't. So we have to look empirically to see, well, does it work? This is the classic work of uh, Peter Beale flying helicopters with model predictive control. Has a model of the helicopter uh, flying upside down, doing all kinds of crazy things. Not a perfect model, but it works quite well. There's now a lot of drones that have some kind of model, do MPC through it, and, and they fly happily around. Uh, here is the work from Evangelos Theodor's group in uh, Georgia Tech, where they put a model of this little car on a GPU that's in the car, and they're doing model predictive control in real time. And it's doing some crazy things like sleeping and whatnot. Works perfectly fine, fully model-based. Here's something we did. This is uh, interesting. Here, you're learning a model on the fly, and then you're optimizing a trajectory with respect to that model. Then you're playing the trajectory on the system, collecting some more sensor data, relearning the model. And the model is just a time-varying locally linear model, which is why you can learn it in like 10 or 15 iterations. So this is pretty amazing. So this 24 degree of freedom hand learns to turn this object in a total of 75 repetitions of that behavior. And, and that's it. 
um, because you know there's enough data to learn the local model and, and control around it. This is an example where um, the nominal model isn't good enough, so we had to create an ensemble of models that are slightly different, only 10 of them, and then we plan a trajectory that's feasible with respect to all 10 of them, and the idea is that if something works for 10 different models in simulation, it probably works for anything in between, and hopefully your real system is somewhere in between, and uh, uh, this little guy does that. This is particularly nice, so this is planned how to get up from the ground with all kinds of collisions and frictions and such, and it actually does it. Uh, and here's, of course, the OpenAI thing that I'm sure you, you've all seen, which is another example of this domain randomization idea, but in this case, they're actually learning policies and not just trajectories. And so this is actually quite remarkable when it came out. So you give it a desired cube orientation, and it manipulates the cube to put it in that orientation. Um, and so there are multiple approaches here. Model predictive control is just optimizing a trajectory through the model in real time and shifting the horizon. Offline trajectory optimization I'll talk more about today. You, you can use this to optimize longer, more complicated trajectories. Policy gradient, you know what it is, a neural network in this case. They could be nominal models, they could be adaptive local models, they could be randomized physics models, all kinds of things you could do. Of course, you could also do model free RL, but there's some issues. The existing results, from, especially from Sergey Levin and, and other people around Berkeley and Google, they're really impressive, but they're impressive because of the computer vision. In other words, if you took away the computer vision, you had full state estimation, nobody would care about those results. They would correspond to solved problem in robotics from 30 years ago. So the fact that these things actually work with vision in the real world without Vicon markers, without anything, that's amazing. But that's because deep learning for vision is amazing. It's not because of the control success, really. Uh, they work well in quasi-static tasks where sampling is, can be safe and automated, so you can actually get it off the ground. Uh, you could extend that regime a little bit by having specialized objects, like for example, this is what my former student uh, Vikash uh, has been doing. He's going to be giving a talk tomorrow, but even you know, though if, if your hand that is trying to learn how to manipulate an object is dropping the object all the time, uh, you could just mount the object on a motor and make sure it doesn't go anywhere and you can spin it. And so that greatly simplifies learning, but you know, clearly doesn't scale very well. Now, this is important. The clearly situations where building a good model is just a nightmare. And in some sense, control is easier than modeling. But that does not automatically mean that RL is a good idea. Because that, those may be situations where sampling is just you shouldn't even think about it. Like, for example, controlling a bulldozer. How many people would volunteer to sample a bulldozer while sitting in it? Uh, What's Part there. Uh, well, well, the interactions of the dirt with itself, how it compresses when you roll over it. I mean, you can do something approximate to like a thousand spheres that are glued and you get the notion of pushing, but the notion of like what happens when you roll over it and how it compresses it, that I, you, look, anything could be modeled given enough effort. That's not the question. The question is should you put, if, if your goal is to control and not to model it, should you put that effort first into an accurate model and and do model-based control, or should you just go do something else? There are clearly situations where you should go do something else. Another actually very simple situation is this. If you just want rigid grasping, all you have to do is close your fingers. I mean, what is the object going to do? It has to end up somewhere in your hand, right? You don't, don't, you don't have to understand every single thing that happens. So there clearly are very simple control strategies with a small number of knobs you can tune. And if you tune those right, it's going to work. But that's not at all reinforcement learning. In fact, that's not learning at all. That's just human creativity and, and engineering. And I think in the situations that are too hard to model, most of the time it's really human creativity that solves it and not any form of learning. Of course, there are situations where, ML3, yes, sorry, go, go ahead, yeah. So you would say that iterative improvement of a repetitive task is not learning? The sorry, what? Iterative improvement of parameters in a repetitive task Ah, is not well, so, sorry, I mean, I don't know. Fine. Uh, I, 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 I'm happy to say that's not learning. I, I, I don't care if, if it's learning or not. It's a different type of learning, right? It's, uh, it's a very heavily structured control architecture with a small number of gains you're tuning. Sure, yeah. I mean, we can call it learning if you want, but it's completely I, I don't, not I don't, I don't. obviously what people want to talk about. <laughs> now, there are also situations that you could model, like, for example, is Boston Dynamics Humanoid? But still, people prefer to do manual design and do it very carefully, and they're doing better robotics than anyone else on the planet by laborious manual design, not even by 
model-based optimization just by you know a bunch of really smart people tweaking knobs. But before that, tweaking the knobs, deciding what knobs to create for themselves so they can tweak those. That's the tricky part. That's what we don't know how to automate. Once the knobs are there, anyone can tweak them. But what knobs do we put there? And what's the machine with the knobs on top of it? That's the hard part. Um, so you, you need uh, models to do that, and you better be able to simulate them. Did, uh, so throughout this talk, I'm using this simulator called Mujoko, which I've been developing for now 11 years. And that's what enabled me to leave academia behind and just sell software licenses. Uh, so you can simulate all kinds of systems, uh, the various robots, the attendant driven things, you can play Jenga. It's actually really hard to play Jenga because getting all the contact inter interactions right is, is a nightmare. Uh, you have all kinds of robots, you can have humanoids sliding on the matworks height field. It's very important to have it there. You have like a thousand spheres, you can have clots these days. You can have a humanoid on a hammock. That's, uh, you can tie ropes with the mouse. If you try to do it to reinforcement learning, apparently people are trying and failing for the time being. But I'm sure somebody will release something at some point. Uh, it's very, the simulator itself is very robust, just the, the task is hard. You can do spongy things. Uh, you can even have like skeletons with like 90 muscles attached to them. So we can simulate lots of things. Uh, just to introduce a bit of notation, Q is position, V is velocity, tau are applied forces. There's some uh, bias uh, terms in the matrix. J is a Jacobian of uh, contacts and maybe other constraints. Lambda are constrained forces or contact forces. So uh, for dynamics, you would think that physics would be a solved problem, but it isn't because of constraints and especially contacts. And what I mean by it's not a solved problem is that there's no formula that tells you what the equations of motion are. To compute the equations of motion, you actually need to solve an optimization problem numerically at every time step in order to know how the universe advances from one time step to the next. And so you might ask, what will happen if the universe fails to solve that problem? Does it like end? <laughs> Thankfully, it solves it every time. So we don't know how it does it. But when we do it, we have to solve an optimization problem. Uh, in Mujoku, that optimization problem happens to be convex after a lot of work that I put into reformulating the physics of contact so it can become convex and yet reasonably realistic. In most uh, alternative simulators like physics, ODE, bullet, etc., it's actually solving a non-convex uh, problem, which is like a LCP with a non-positive definite matrix. Um, but anyway, so for dynamics uh, is done through numerical optimization. It's very fast. You can see some numbers here. So for example, a full humanoid flailing around on a 10-core processor, you can collect 300,000 samples per second on a desktop processor. Um, importantly, this thing also has inverse dynamics. So what inverse dynamics means is given the position, velocity, and acceleration of the system, I can compute the force which generated that acceleration in that position and velocity. So if you want to think about the, uh, what's that in an MDP, given the, so MDP for dynamics is given the state and the action, the MTP tells you the probability over next state and it gets sampled from that. The inverse dynamics would be given the current state and the next state that you observed, what with the posterior over actions. And obviously for that you need some kind of prior and it gets messy very quickly and it's probably not very useful. But in continuous control, that's actually an extremely useful quantity. Yeah, well, in all, all your problems is, uh, is, this over, uh, is uh, properly constrained, meaning that like, it's not underdetermined? The inverse what? The inverse? No, not at all. Uh, never. So, I mean, this is actually very simple. So the forward is a solution to optimization problem, which is, happens to be convex. Yeah. So we know the global minimum is given by setting the gradient to zero. Yeah. This simply says the gradient of that is zero, and it's rearranged. And so I'm just saying we're guaranteed that that thing is strongly convex. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because this is uh, basically, this is uh, strongly convex. This just says F equals MA penalized with the inertia matrix, which is always symmetric positive definite. And this is adding something that is weakly convex. But yeah. do you mean that like the inverse dynamics is feasible like no matter how I set V dot and whatnot? Exactly. Yeah. So this is a soft contact model and soft constraint model. Okay, so For any crazy thing you may choose to do, there exists a finite, possibly very large force, which would have made the system do that in that configuration. When we do optimal control, we're going to say that we don't like, like very large force, and so all of this will be pruned out automatically, but we can handle it. Now, uh, Inverse dynamics, as I mentioned, uh, it's something very useful in control. So, so again, just uh, forward means mapping from position velocity and force to acceleration, and then you do numerical integration. Inverse means mapping from position velocity and acceleration to tau. 
If you have that, you can do really simple things like computer torque control. Namely, you plan some desired trajectory, which is a sequence of positions over time. You compute the velocity accelerations numerically. Use reverse, inverse dynamics to figure out the force which will have given that trajectory. And you play that force in open loop, and you can put some closed loop around it. That probably accounts for more applications of control than everything else combined. Uh, and these things can work amazingly well, as you probably aware, here's a little industrial robot doing fast and accurate and, and crazy Stella stuff. And it just works. How is this Stella? No, this is called the, uh, what is it called? The Adept something or other. It's one of the industrial, the good industrial robots. Uh, of course, this, this is very limited. It basically has to be a fully actuated system. But it, if, if it is fully actuated, we're done. Okay. Now, uh, here's a uh, general algorithm based on, on the notion of the inverse dynamics and the fact we can use it. So we're going to represent the trajectory. So we're going to tra do trajectory optimization here. No control law for now, just trajectory. As a sequence of poses from time 0 to t minus 1. Um, so this big Q is the, our decision variable. is the thing we're trying to optimize. Define velocity accelerations with finite differences in time. Run your physics and geometry computations to compute the applied forces and all kinds of other things you may care about. Define some trajectory cost, which depends on all of the above, but it's additive over time. And of course, that's key to having efficiency. Uh, if there are constraints, uh, under actuation constraints are particularly important in inverse dynamics. Because as we said, you can postulate any trajectory, and there is always some force that will have generated it. In some cases, it's obviously a bad idea because you're trying to penetrate the wall. The wall is pushing back. You're going to penalize that. But the more subtle and more important thing is that if you have a passive system, like some of the degrees of freedom of this object are not actuated, right? So I should not be putting force directly on the position and orientation of this object. I'm only allowed to do that through contact interactions. So when my inverse dynamics outputs tau, that tau better be zero in the dimensions where I don't have a motor or a muscle attached to the system. And that's really important. If you don't do that, you just do wishful thinking and you fly through space and you're done. So this, uh, these are nonlinear uh, equality constraints that are really important. You could also impose inequality constraints by saying that the control shouldn't get too large. Uh, I tend to not care too much about that because you can just do that with soft like half quadratic costs. And as long as you keep it far from the largest controls, you don't really care. If you want to do something really like bang bang control where you're really going to saturate your motors, fine. But people usually want to operate things in a regime where they're not about to fall apart. Uh, and so this is just a straightforward optimization problem. Uh, the way I, I like to solve it is to form an augmented uh, Lagrangian where you end up uh, estimating the Lagrange multipliers uh, online and use the Gauss-Newton method. Uh, one thing that's very important here, which kind of relates to the, for the cost being additive over time is that the Hessians end up being band diagonal. Uh, here, in this case, I actually allow cyclic trajectory. So if you want to uh, compute a movement that repeats itself, I can say that the first state and the last state are the same. I don't know what they are, but they should be the same. So that's actually an interesting example where you cannot apply dynamic programming because there is no time axis. And time has a topology of a circle now. But it's perfectly fine optimization problem, and it's very meaningful from a control perspective. So if you do that, and you factorize your Hessian, it ends up being an arrowhead uh, matrix with Cholesky factorization. But it has these big wide regions. And now if you add more time steps, obviously the com complexity of this thing grows linearly. So if you look at the Riccati equations, basically it's an alternative way to exploit that sparsity. It's just a recursive factorization of a band diagonal Hessian. Whether you do it like that, or you uh, form the whole thing and just hit it with Chulesky, it actually makes no difference. Um, so let's see an example of that. So, oh my god, the lights are bad. So here's this little hopper that you can barely see. It's a cyclic trajectory, 200 time steps, 10 milliseconds each, so two second movement. I'm constraining it. I'm, I have two uh, hard constraints at two poses of this thing up and down, so it can somehow have to transition between the two. Just a co uh, control cost and nothing else. Is what it does. So the initial trajectory, how it's initialized, is just a interpolation between the two poses. And after it's optimized, it does that and goes through all the contacts. The optimizer considers all the forces explicitly and figures it out. Um, happens over time. How long did it take? This took 245 iterations in a total of 700 milliseconds. So these are 1,000 decision variables, meaning 200 time steps, five positions each. So we optimize 1,000 real values in 0.7 seconds, if we do it right. Um, this is something really interesting. 
So this is somewhere in the middle of the, of the optimization. This is a time step of over trajectories. The different colors here are the different joints. So this thing has five joints. And this is the gradient. So I'm plotting the gradient itself as a trajectory, which, right, so it is. And you can see that it has this very spiky nature over time. Why is it so spiky? Because whenever there is a contact, if you change the configuration a little bit, the forces change a lot, and it's extremely sensitive to that. And then if you're somewhere else, you change things, and not, not much happens. So you get these very, very badly behaved gradients. If you try to do first order gradient descent on this, you're going to be stuck instantly, right? Because uh, following the gradient is a bad idea. You end up with trajectories that are clearly going to be about you. But here's the good news. You use Gauss-Newton. So we're not just following the gradient. We're multiplying the gradient by the inverse of a Gauss-Newton-Hessian. And when you do that, that nasty spiky thing beca becomes that perfectly reasonable smooth thing. And now this is a trajectory deformation or search direction that we can go explore. So basically, how does that happen? Well, the Hessian has the right scale and the right captures the right correlations among the variables. So it, it cancels this nastiness here and produces something nice. And, and that's, that's the magic. So without that, like first order gradient set again, like forget it, basically. Um, now, of course, we can also use the forward dynamics and do model predictive control. Over here, what I did is this took like 200 iterations to converge in, uh, because we started from scratch. Remember, we started with this thing that just goes up and down like dramatically. Uh, in MPC, the way you do it is you already have a trajectory that you optimized. This is your initial state. You start executing it. The world deviates from that. You optimize a new trajectory. But when you optimize the second trajectory, you warm start with the first one. So normally, you have time for only one Gauss-Newton iteration when you do MPC. In fact, if you have time for more, an argument could be made that you should uh, either uh, make the horizon longer or reduce the time step instead of running more. I mean, that's kind of an empirical question. But the point is that warm start is the reason why MPC ever works. Um, of course, you have to do it fast. So you need efficient physics simulation. You need good optimization algorithms. This iterative LQR is something that I published a while ago. It's basically the Gauss-Newton version of differential dynamic programming from Jacobson many years ago. Uh, and it has some clever robustness tricks. Uh, and cost functions have to be designed really, really carefully. In this global inverse dynamics thing, the cost function can be something very basic, and it figures it out because it has many iterations. When you're doing MPC and you have only one iteration, you'd better design your cost carefully. So the game you're playing here is you as a human problem designer are heuristically guessing what the value function might look like. And the thing that you're calling a cost is really a bit more like a value in your head. Like As far as the optimizer is concerned, it's a cost. But if you just put a, what's, what's called a sparse cost, uh, probably not going to happen. But then again, tweaking the weights on a cost function is not that hard. You know, you pick the five or 10 terms that you believe are relevant to your problem and just tweak them and watch the thing, because the thing is happening in real time. Right? You don't have to wait for a month for your neural network to converge. It actually happens in milliseconds. Uh, so these things. What would be the IOPR here versus the, uh, if you have a warm start, it's just the other, the other methods just aren't amenable to warm starting? Oh, no, the, this is amenable to warm starting. Uh, nobody has, is using these things for MPC right now. I'm actually about to start doing that. My feeling is that these are more powerful and more robust, but a bit slower. Yeah. Uh, the shooting methods are, when they work, you know, if you read the old books on uh, numerical recipes, what they tell you, you know, shoot first, relax later, <laughs> right? So <laughs> this, is a, this is a relaxation method, the other one is shooting method. If that works, you should use that. The, the shooting could be more stable, uh, just like if there's any kind of noise in the system, or it's like multimodal, it seems like you actually want to consider uh, I mean, maybe if you did IOQG with like multiple linearization zone different like an ensemble thing uh, like, yeah basically so you could do that but you can also do the other thing and ensemble more as well in fact people actually people here in this department Zoran Popovich has done uh, and company did that a while ago with uh, uh, have an ensemble of trajectories and put CMA on top of it and, and that actually was really that good video was the, uh, that one video is also kind of do you think like the ensemble uh, the ensemble definitely gives you robustification at the expense of n times more computation but the shooting is very cheap for Ah, no, 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 no. Shooting and uh, the, uh, the, the, the computational speed, like what you have to do per iteration is the same for all of these. Like, like I said, the Hessian is band diagonal and the derivative oh, syndrome, and everything is the same computation. The question is how many iterations does each take and what happens during the line search? Sorry, what? Because it's in the simulator, it's in the same computation. Yeah. 
Thank you. Well, it's always going to be a set. MPC is always going to be a set. Yeah, right. right. Some of these things you don't get the derivatives out of it. So then, if you don't have the derivatives, yeah. So if you don't have derivatives, then you have to ask yourself where do you get the derivatives. Yeah. Then yeah. shooting methods have an interesting advantage that you could actually shoot a bunch of trajectories without derivatives, yeah. do linear regression, you approximate the derivatives, and do the Riccati equations with those. That that can be a good trick. In fact, some people in uh, Europe working in computer graphics have done that, and they've gotten results that are like comparable to ours. In some cases, even better. Let me show you some of our old results. So this is a humanoid that's asked to get up. The cost basically says put your torso over the feet, don't move too much, and there's some angular momentum trick. So the, there's some tricks here, but at the end it works in real time on the desktop. So we pull it and it figures out how to save itself and uh, how to get up again. So these are all invented on, on the fly. This was done like seven, eight years ago now. You can do guys on unicycles, you can do this is an interesting example, actually. So here, we're changing the cost in real time. And you can see that, well, what's going on? OK, previously, he was driving around and trying not to fall. Now, we told him that he really shouldn't move. So he started using his arms more to, to balance. So you can really change the behavior that comes out of it by changing cost terms. This is something that Vikash did. They used to get an object and put it somewhere. And again, it's, it's MPC. So these methods can, can work, not always. And they're not that robust, but when they work, they're it's pretty amazing that they work because there's no learning, right? It just makes it up on the fly and you're done. Uh, now, of course, there is no reason not to do learning. And uh, recently, what we'll do is combine MPC with value functions learning. So let me just uh, talk about this first. So we're going to minimize our sequence of controls uh, up to some horizon in the future. Normally, we'll just do that. That's how you do MPC. And then what happens on the horizon? Well, nothing, because you don't know what happens afterwards. But what if you had an approximate to the value function? Then you should add that to, to your MPC cost and optimize that, right? Because MPC just plans, OK, here's my trajectory from here to here. And is the good thing to be here? Well, I don't know. So I need some function to tell me that. Uh, this is the exactly equivalent to the Monte Carlo tree search, for example, that the DeepMind people did in, in uh, AlphaGo, where they learned some kind of value function. It's not good enough to play by itself, but when you put uh, tree search on top of it, it cleans it up. In control, there's no need for tree search, simply because if you know the initial state, you could allow the thing to search for a tree of trajectories. But what happens is all of them collapse to the same thing, because there's usually one optimal trajectory starting from the state that you're in. And the sensitivities are kind of smooth. Unlike a game scenario where the opponent takes one different move and that sen same sends the game on a completely different path. That doesn't usually ha uh, happen in continuous systems. You could imagine some obstacles and you have to go around. You that could, right, exactly. So you have to make up an example where that happens. Like if the obstacle is exactly in front of you and left, uh, left and right is exactly equally good, or if you're standing, you want to start walking, you could start with the left foot and, and the right foot. Yeah, you could make up examples so that they're rare and it doesn't matter how you resolve the symmetry. Someone would say that those are the interesting examples where you have those kind of obstacles. Oh no, obstacles are interesting, but obstacles are usually not exactly on your path to the target, so it's obvious which side you should go. Well, but something more complicated than just obstacle learning. Well, so I can tell you that people did that, and they showed demos, and in their demos, the so-called tree actually collapsed into a trajectory, so they wasted their time. Uh, it may be slightly more robust in some situations, and it goes back to the shooting that you're talking about. If you're going to throw a bunch of things, you might as well make them deviate a little bit and, and then interpolate. Uh, and so then how do we learn this value function? Well, if we have a bunch of quasi-optimal trajectories, then the optimal value function has to be consistent with them through a Bellman backup, right? And so we can use that to do offline learning. This is some math that, I mean, I basically told you what, what matters. Uh, here's some examples. This guy was trained to go and push this cube and has to make it stop. And the ground slippery, so he's doing these heroic maneuvers to make the cube stop. Uh, this is the open AI thing that we can now do roughly 100 times faster than they can in, in simulation because of this trick. I mean, the, the sampling is complexity is a bit hard to count because there are complications in both cases, but it's a lot faster than what they were able to do. So this, so this is a good method. Now, we're even doing some exploration in value functions, but I won't talk about that. Now, looking more generally, the pattern here is this. You have a joint optimization between some global parameters and a bunch of trajectories. And you can f think of it as a joint optimization problem where you minimize bo all, all, both the trajectories and these global parameters. Now, you can use ADMM or iterative methods and fix one and optimize the other, but it starts out as a joint problem. 
And there are lots of instances of that that are all interesting. The last I showed you is called Polo Plan Online Learn Offline. So here the state that means the value function parameters, and this cost L is just the optimal control cost, plus a consistency cost saying that the value function has to be consistent through the Bellman backup, so you have to check this. Another example is a, a guided policy search, which is quite popular. Uh, Sergey Levin and company developed that. So in that case, you learn policy parameters. And again, you have a consistency condition. But in that case, consistency is between trajectories you're optimizing and the policy. You could do system ID, where now the meaning of the parameters uh, is some model parameters, not policy parameters. And what's the meaning of the cost? Well, you have some uh, price over the model parameters, most likely. And now you have an estimation cost that you want your model to agree with your sensor data for those model parameters. You can also do optimal mechanism design, where, again, you parameterize the model. And you ask yourself, how do I, what robot should I build so it can walk, for instance? So you can do that. Is, uh, you can leave a bunch of um, real valued parameters undefined and go solve that problem jointly, where now you both generate locomotion behaviors and figure out what the parameters should be at the same time. So it's a very general and very useful thing. It again has this arrowhead structure because now all the trajectories line up here. We're not going to allow limit cycles here because it's more of a control setting. These parameters state that they affect the cost at all times, so they form dense rows of this Hessian. But again, as if you add more and more trajectories, uh, the thing grows linearly and factorization is, is efficient. Um, how am I doing with time? When do you want me to end? 10.35. Uh, 10.35, OK. Uh, now, here is the thing that you could do, adopting this sort of determin. So you, you probably noticed that I treat the world as being deterministic, because guess what? That screen has been here throughout my talk. It didn't shake. I don't know if you noticed. So the state transitions of the MGP are actually delta functions. Um, you could, of course, stochastic control is a very exciting thing. There are lots of situations where you can apply it. The physical world is not one of those situations. There is quantum noise, but it's negligible. That's why Newtonian mechanics actually is a pretty good description of the world. So this whole notion that all oh, the world is stochastic, no, it's not. It's deterministic. It only starts shaking when you shake it, because either because you don't know what you're doing or because you're shaking it intentionally. Both of these are bad ideas. I'm not sure which one is worse even. Um, of course, I'm not saying you shouldn't explore. If you really want to explore, fine, go explore. But I, there's no you reason to do so. To yeah. the wind. What? Yeah. The wind is not the noise. The wind is not noise. What? You don't understand the it's wind. So that doesn't make it noise. First of all. Second of all, it's not a toast. No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So, that, like, the, the, uh, this old <laughs> quote from Mike Jordan when I was a student, uh, probability is a model of our ignorance. Sure. The wind is not noise. We just don't know what it is. So we call it noise. We capture some statistics that happen too much, but they, they, they completely miss the point. It's not now. In particular, if you look at wind, it doesn't jitter okay. randomly. If you think this is a well understood thing, right? Of course, it's you're marginalizing over the degrees Sorry, of freedom. What? You're marginalizing over the unknown degrees of freedom. It's that is a okay, no, complete. I mean, this is all. Yes, yes, yes. This is already a well understood thing. This is what I'm saying is that statistics misses the point of the physical world because the physical world is not random. I think. Hilary Bouchard. I have a look at that one actually. If you're writing a simulator, you just didn't call this different seeds in your ensemble method and simulate all of the noise uh, in your trajectory. So, you, so I think you can like run multiple uh, seeds for what the wind is. Uh, so no, but, no, but, but ignore wind. Thing. Think about humans. So I was doing autonomous control of, of a vehicle, right. and there was this child. Do you know if he's going to, to, to run on the road or not? I don't. That does not make the, the child random. Oh, it does. No, 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 no. Child is random. Okay, this, this is a detailed software discussion, which you can continue. But no, what you're saying is that that there's a difference between uncertainty and Gaussian noise. Yeah. Everybody just assumes I'm, that all uncertainty is Gaussian noise. What's so that? So that, so that, so that I. You have to be crazy. Yeah, right. Yeah. You have to be crazy. I'm, and yet. Yeah. And yet. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm saying that, but that's not important. What I'm saying is that when you're controlling a physical system, even if you want to replace uncertainty with noise and think of the same thing, both the uncertainty and noise are very small. And they're certainly not jittering the system like crazy, which is what an MDP would do. Well, which is why, sorry, what? I am not thinking about, you know, like when you have uh, touching parts and then they may touch or may not touch. 
if you try to model that exactly like in a real world situation where you don't have exact state knowledge you're gonna run into so state trouble. uncertainty is uh, is a separate uh, issue it should not be confused with dynamics noise so you can have noise in your sensors and that's actually real thermal noise and it could be quite large because of that noise, you don't know what the state is, but you do know that whatever the state is, there's going to be a perfectly nice and smooth deterministic trajectory starting from that state. You just don't know what the state is. You know it's not going. Look, there's a big difference between a trajectory starting at an unknown place and going straight versus a trajectory doing Brownian motion. Like, I hope you can agree with that, right? Yeah, MTP is modeled the world as Brownian motion, which is a joke, yes. Maybe I think that also I agree with, right? But the other thing I think you're trying to say here is that if the uncertainty is large or significant, you're going to be in trouble, right? We don't do control in those cases. Of course, yeah, you buy more sensors, yeah. like you don't, before you start doing control. Uh, OK, so fine. OK, so this is the. <laughs> Self-driving cars don't work, right? You don't have self-driving cars. You don't have self-driving cars. Airplanes, try to put yourself in a state where you don't fly through thunderstorms. Because if you do, you'll crash. No, like people do this. <laughs> okay, guys, look, this is a discussion uh, point. Let, let's, let's move on. So, uh, so here's. I have a quick comment on the back. We do do control when there's lots of stochasticity, but sometimes we just model it as a bandit problem. Uh, so if there's lots of stochasticity, we can't project like you know consumers' behavior, etc. We could just treat it as a one-time step. Problem. No, uh, but that, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with so that. I'm definitely saying we just don't do control. In those cases, we do do control. Yeah. We just do it. That's why I'm emphasizing, I'm talking about physical systems. Once you go into like stock market, social things, no, if, if humans you can kick a ball, Sorry, what? Do, if I kick a ball, you can really predict where it will end? Yeah. yeah. After, yeah. after 10 milliseconds after you kick it, no, yes. No, no, before, come on. But that's not a double same thing as an MTP. <laughs> it's not an MTP. The ball, the ball isn't like doing that. It's moving on a parabola. <laughs> Well, I actually agree with Samo that there is no real noise, but maybe it's useful to be model noise sometimes, even though sometimes, we the yes. physical systems are Sometimes not it's useful, it's just not most it's of the time tool. and not when you're controlling machines. The reason is because you don't have a good model, that's why. You okay, yeah, it's look, let, let's. Uh, when do you go? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so here's what, how you can do policy gradients very easily if uh, you do the following. Actually, that covers your bulk kicking example. We're going to absorb all noise in the set of initial states. And the set of initial states is going to become part of our problem formulation. So you give me the initial states that you believe are interest to you, which would be like 10 milliseconds after you hit the ball in five different ways. And that from that point on, I'm going to assume everything is deterministic. I'm going, there's a bunch of trajectories, there's dynamics, there's a policy, there's some parameters. And now the cost is just a function of the trajectories, which depends on the parameters. You can roll it out. Uh, this, by the way, resembles the notion of a mini batch in supervised learning. So, what do you do? So, there is stochastic gradient descent. Right? What is stochastic about gradient descent? Well, the neural network is perfectly deterministic, thankfully, that's why the whole thing works. Uh, the only thing stochastic is that you pick a random subset of queries, right? So, you can think of that as picking a subset of initial states that you want to care about. After you pick your random subset of images in computer, so <laughs> after you pick some random images in computer vision, then after that you roll the network deterministically, you do backprop deterministically, you do gradient descent deterministically, and encode stochastic afterwards. Uh, we can be doing that with uh, policy gradients, and we're going to save ourselves a lot of pain of sampling, worrying about the uh, bias, various trade-offs, and, and so forth. And uh, I mean, it's pretty. Trivial, you can just do the math. Basically, you need a recursive uh, thing over time that uh, propagates the sensitivity of the state with, with respect to parameters, and then you just do chain rule. Basically, there's nothing to it. Uh, we've done this about 15 years ago on simple systems. It worked like a charm. We didn't even call it learning because it looked like a solved problem, basically. So we wrote papers about neuroscience modeling how the brain works at the time. Um, now, here's the last thing I want to end with. Uh, point about optimization, there's a distinction between optimization and discovery. And that happens a lot in what I do due to contact dynamics. So imagine a landscape that looks like that. It has some kind of nice behavior. If, if I start too close to that, gradient descent and 20 other things are going to work. But there can be these large landscapes where there's no local information whatsoever to tell you where the solution is. And so if you start somewhere here and going to here, that's what 
we call, call this cow, like some big change that a human may envision and make it, and then once after that change, good things happen. But there's no reason to expect an optimizer to ever figure it out automatically. You could sample, but then sampling grows exponentially with the radius of how far the good solutions are, gradients don't work, etc. cetera. Uh, why does this happen with contact dynamics? Here's why. Suppose I'm here, my goal is to move that laser pointer. I start moving my hands around, there's no contact between me and that, the cost does not change. In fact, if I move my hands, the cost goes up because I'm expending energy, but the task isn't getting accomplished. So no sensible optimizer will, should ever discover that, oh, by the way, I should take a few steps and touch that thing and then start manipulating with it. Unless the design, the human designer puts some information under the hood and doesn't tell the reviewers of their paper. Right? That's the only way that can actually happen. Um, here's an example of that. This is, uh, experiment. This is something that we did uh, a few, uh, couple of years ago. So I'm just show you some results. So these are a bunch of neural networks trained with uh, policy gradients that I'll explain in a moment. They do pretty complicated things, so hand moving objects to, to targets. So this just shows that it works for different initial and final conditions. Here we tell it the desired position of this obstacle, figures out how to put it there. It works again for various targets and such. So this is a, this is a pre-trained neural network which is running it to show that it does the job. Here the goal is to hammer that nail and it happily does that. Um, here the goal is to open a door and that's that. Now, um, if you just do RL training with so-called sparse rewards, most of these problems actually have this feature, like your hand has to do something before something else happens and you basically have to wait forever. Ironically, the only thing that actually works is that pen example. From a control perspective, that may be the hardest task. From an RL perspective, it's the only one feasible because you're in a situation where if you start wiggling your fingers, something will happen. And so, this is complicated, but you're in the regime. You're in the regime. The other it just doesn't get off the ground. If you start shaping it, you can kind of do it with a lot of labor. What we did is something called demonstration augmented policy gradient, which is basically a very simple idea. You do policy gradient on a composite cost that's the usual cost you would optimize plus an imitation cost. What does that mean? It means that we're going to evaluate our policy on a bunch of demonstration states in some database, and we're going to ask the policy to stay close to whatever that demonstrated it. And that makes a dramatic improvement. So one way to solve this discovery uh, problem is to just download the knowledge from a human brain into a network via demonstrations. Uh, so let me just show you it's a bit of comic relief. This is a little robot that I built. I kind of copied it from my, from Vikash and made it better. Um, I have four fingers instead of three. That's why it's better. <laughs> uh, so here I'm heroically trying to teleoperate this thing. Uh, and it's really hard. Actually, for the, by the way, that, that may be the only example where anyone has successfully done like teleoperation of dexterous manipulation. We actually make and break contacts. Usually people do grasping and moving, but this thing is ridiculously hard. You need a very specialized system and pretty clever software aids to, like, so for example, the mapping here is not one-to-one. -one. I had to invent quite a few things. It's a pain. And if you're trying to like teleoperate something like a humanoid, whatever, it's hard. Um, discovery is usually done by humans in the real world. We would like to think that the computer just hands over policy to the robot. That's not true. There is actually a human up there. What the human does is informally observes what happens and goes in and makes important structural changes, which are really the reason why anything works. Just look through some examples. So in Boston Dynamics, these are the humans up there. It's our Ritzy. They have this approach of this multiple regions of attraction, basically a bunch of um, state-dependent simple controls that they tune by hand. In our case, we had these value functions for MPC that really need to be tuned. If you look at OpenAI case, this is interesting. This is a new toolbox of knobs that the humans can tweak. So you do this domain randomization, like you, you randomize various aspects of the model and throw it in, you retrain. But what do you randomize? There are infinitely many things you can randomize. There are very few you can actually do in practice. And which one, you, once you pick matter a lot, and so what they, they randomize this, that, and the other, and that's where the human intuition comes in here, what to randomize next. There's no way to invent that automatically, and that's critical. And there is, we've been trying, we've been working on something called contact environment optimization, which is a way to do automated discovery in the specific domain of contact. So when that nasty landscape is caused by contacts, we kind of have an automated way to handle it. In general, you cannot handle it because in general, that would mean doing global search somehow, and you know, that's not tractable. But if you know something about what's causing that nastiness, you may be able to handle it. 
So here the idea is this. So in these situations where contacts are the only thing that gives you control authority, you need an automated way to discover which contacts are good for you when. And one way to do it is to allow yourself some kind of virtual contact forces that can act from a distance, that can accomplish the task for you if possible, but then you're going to penalize them, and you're going to penalize them in such a way that if I'm here and the thing wants to move forward and I can be like a Jedi and say move and it moves, that's the virtual contact force. Now the solver is going to say, oh, you want to move that thing. Great, but you have to touch it first. So now the solver will give me the power to do that, put that virtual force, but it will also automatically add a cost on that distance, and the optimizer now will know that it has to go and snap into that configuration. Um, there's a formal way to do this. Unfortunately, I'm out of time, so I'm just going to play some videos for you and we're done. Uh, so this is the work of Igor Mordak from my lab. Uh, let me just go to the more impressive things. Uh, so this whole thing is optimized as one movie, like all these contact points and such. You can tell it to go to various positions. Um, let's just fast forward through it. You can think and do handstands. So each, in, in each one of those cases, it's, a, it's the dynamic, uh, it's the inverse dynamics trajectory optimization. So the whole trajectory is optimized as one. If you don't do this virtual contact force magic that I told you about, any solver would get stuck because we're in this nasty green shape thing where there's no reason to make progress actually. But with, if you allow contacts to kind of give hints to the optimizer automatically, then, then good things can happen. Uh, I'll try to briefly explain how Maybe I should end. Okay, no, I'm told not to explain anything briefly. Okay, thank you for listening. <laughs> I think one final question before the break. What was your brief explanation? Sorry? What was your brief explanation? <laughs> the brief explanation is this. I'm going to have a cost function preprocessor. I'm going to discover terms that are quadratic in the applied forces, including the non-physical forces. And I'm going to allow myself to invent virtual forces that explain away some of that cost. And then I'm going to put a regularizer on, on it, which has something like a complementarity condition, which says if you invent the virtual force, you'd better close the distance between those two contacts. And now I'm going to replace that quadratic with a cost which is defined as the minimizer of something. So in order to evaluate that cost, I actually have to solve an optimization problem on an inner loop. Conveniently, it happens to be a convex QP, so it's fast. And then I can evaluate it. I can differentiate it analytically at that uh, solution. And so then my master optimizer is just seeing some weird cost, which happens to evaluate itself by calling another optimizer. But that's OK, because it can do that. Can we uh, implement this scan, uh, contact invariant optimization for uh, optimizing any trajectory where there is impact from the ground, like uh, with the contact? Uh, you could, but the thing with impact with the ground is gravity is going to make it happen without you trying. So uh, I'm not sure it will, you would gain anything there. Where you gain is like if there's some contact that if you have to take a sequence of actions that's going to establish some contact, which then allows you to do something else, then this thing is very helpful. Something like falling and hitting the ground, gravity does that for you. So I'm not sure. I mean, you can use it, but I'm not sure you're going to buy you anything. Okay. All right. Thank you.